Welcome to Virtual Office Hours, How to Excel in Law School Exam, sponsored by the ABA and JD Advising. We're really excited to have Heather Buck with us to provide tips to help you prepare for and take the law, law school exams. Heather Buck graduated cum laude in the top 10% of her class at Wayne State University Law School. She received numerous scholarships and awards at Wayne State, including the Patrick J. Bucket Award, which is given to the top first year law student in the legal research and writing course. She also served on the Wayne Law Review's executive board as a production editor. Heather has passed the Michigan bar exam and the California bar exam. After law school, she spent about three years clerking for various judges at the Third Judicial Circuit of Michigan. She also has experience in no-fault litigation and contract and employment law. Heather has been at JD Advising since 2018. She teaches JD Advising's uniform bar exam and California bar exam courses. She also tutors students for the bar exam, all first year law school classes, and for the MPRE. Heather, I uh, will turn things over to you now. Thank you so much, Tracy, and thank you to everyone for joining us today. <clears throat> so as Tracy said, we're going to talk about how to excel on law school exams today. And one of the first things that I want to mention is that success in law school is largely dependent on your success in law school exams. So this is a really important topic. This is something that especially first year students have a lot of um, trouble adjusting to in undergrad, in high school, you probably had lots of assignments, lots of different tests that contributed to your grade. You probably knew how you were doing throughout the semester. You knew how you needed to do on the final to get a passing score in the class. Whereas in law school, your entire grade is usually based on one final exam at the end of the semester. And a lot of times then that means it's hard to know how you're doing. It's hard to know where you stand in comparison with other students in, in the class. Um, because these grades tend to be curved, you want to make sure that you're sitting kind of at the top of that curve or on the right side of the curve to get a good score. And that's something really hard to know. So I'm going to share some insight with you today for how to do well on exams. Um, even if this is your first semester of law school exams, I promise you these tips are going to help you get a better grade uh, on your final exams. So as I said, typically you're going to have one exam <clears throat> for each class to determine your entire grade. And law school exams are meant to test your ability to think critically and your ability to apply apply the law to the to a fact pattern, to a hypothetical fact pattern. They are not expecting you typically to show up and just recite the law. They're, the professors are not usually looking for you to recite things like the names of cases, what judge wrote a particular decision, um, what party's arguments were in a particular case that maybe you read for class. And I think focusing on what law school exams are testing is going to help you see um, what you need to focus on as you're prepping for exams, how to prep for exams, and how to study for what's upcoming for law school. Exams are graded on a very strict curve, especially the first year of law school. In a lot of schools, the curve relaxes during the second and third year, or there isn't as strict of a curve. Uh, but in the first year of law school, it's very hard to get a high grade, an A or an A plus in class. Professors are very limited in how many of those grades they can get give out. So it is really important that you um, do well on the exam. And importantly, that you do better than the person sitting next to you because um, like I said, the, the grades are going to be curved and it's not necessarily about writing a perfect answer. It's about writing a better answer than other people who are in the class with you. So as I said, law school exams are based on two things, how well you know the law and how well you can apply the law. So first of all, with learning the law, you want to make sure you're creating outlines. And I'll talk briefly about that in just a minute. And then that you're reviewing and memorizing your outlines. A lot of people make the mistake of thinking that law school exams are open book and they, they get to take their outlines with them uh, to the exam. So they don't actually have to have that information memorized because it's there and they can just look it up. And I will tell you, if you're relying on looking everything up during the exam, you're not spending enough time writing your answer to that exam and you're missing out on some significant points that you could be earning if you have that information memorized and ready to go. In terms of applying the law, you want to learn an exam taking strategy, and that's what we're going to do today. I'm going to show you how the, a good approach <clears throat> to write a law school exam looks like. And then you need to practice that strategy. And this part is up to you. 
doing practice exams is the best way to get better and to improve your chances of getting one of those high scores on a law school exam. So you want to get your hands on and complete as many practice exams as you can. All right, I'm going to use this sample torts question to illustrate um, some tips for how to write good law exam, law school exam answers. So I'll go ahead and read the question to you, and then we'll talk about what the answer could look like. I'm going to turn this off for just a second. <clears throat> it says, Dan, a dog breeder, had some eight-week-old puppies to sell. Bob and Carol went to his house to look at them. Dan invited them into the living room where the puppies were located and said, whatever you do, don't go into the room at the end of the hall. As they were examining the puppies, the largest puppy, without warning, gave Carol a nasty bite on her hand. Dan told Bob to go to the bathroom near the end of the hall to retrieve some bandages. Forgetting Dan's earlier admonition, Bob opened the door at the end of the hall, thinking it was the bathroom, and entered a darkened room where Dan kept an enormous pet chimpanzee. The chimpanzee jumped between Bob and the door, beat his chest, and made menacing hoots. Frightened, Bob stood still. In attending to Carol's bite, Dan mistakenly grabbed a bottle of heavy-duty solvent, thinking it was a bottle of antiseptic. When Dan rubbed its contents into Carol's wound, she began to scream and shout in pain. Hearing Carol's cries, Bob barged past the chimpanzee, which gave him a deep gash to his head as he passed. Shaken and sore from their injuries, Bob and Carol fled Dan's house. What claims may Carol reasonably raise against Dan? What arguments may Dan reasonably make? And what is the likely outcome? And number two, what claims may Bob reasonably raise against Dan? What arguments may Dan reasonably make? And what is the likely outcome? All right, so as I said, we're gonna use this uh, sample question. This comes from the California bar exam, but this is a great example of what a torts question could look like. You get a hypothetical fact pattern with a pretty open-ended call of the question. They don't tell us what the issues are. They expect you to spot the issues, discuss the law and apply the law to the, to the facts of this fact pattern. So we're gonna use IRAC to, to answer this question. IRAC stands for Issue Rule Analysis Conclusion. And some of you might be thinking, I hear this all the time. Um, my professor said, don't get too hung up on IRAC. When professors say that, what they don't want is a very linear or very um, typical IRAC essay. And I'm gonna show you what a better IRAC is going to look like. Um, and that's actually what they're looking for. They just don't want IRAC, IRAC, because the issues tend to be more complicated and that's not gonna be the best structure to handle those complicated issues. But they don't want you to just throw IRAC out the door altogether. If a professor says, don't get too hung up on IRAC, they're not saying that you shouldn't spot the issues. You shouldn't state the rule. You shouldn't analyze the facts. They still want all of that stuff. They might just not want this very linear um, organization to your answer, but you should still keep IRAC in the back of your mind um, and should use these pieces of IRAC to make sure that you're hitting on everything you need to get the most points. So first we're gonna talk about the issues. Um, the first thing you wanna do is try to spot the issues. I personally like to read the fact pattern and make a list of the issues as I'm going through it. That way I have an idea of what issues I'm gonna to need to discuss as I'm writing my answer. That also helps me with timing. If I know how many issues I have to discuss, I'm gonna have a better idea of how much time I should spend on each issue so that I don't run out of time with issues that I haven't gotten to yet. So looking back at this fact pattern, I highlighted the cause of the question. Carol's is in yellow, Bob's is in green, and you can see some of the facts that go along with each call of the question. So Carol, for instance, suffered two injuries. She got a bite from the puppy. She also got that injury from the heavy duty solvent. Um, it's also worth noting that they were at Dan's house. That's gonna be relevant. And then uh, Bob had that one injury. He had the gash on his head from the chimpanzee. Again, they were at the house and Dan did warn them. He said, don't go into the room at the end of the hall. Um, and Bob went into that room anyway. And those are all gonna be relevant to the issues that are going to need to be discussed for a good answer to this question. <clears throat> so here's a list of some of the issues that this question raises. 
So for Carol, as I said, she had two injuries, the dog bite and the solvent injury. Within the dog bite issue, there's a premises liability discussion to be had. That's the point about them being at Dan's house. Dan is the premises possessor. And so as such, he owes them a duty um, since they're at his house. There's also a duty that people owe from domestic animals. There are a lot of states have dog bite laws that you can talk about. And then with regard to the solvent injury, there's also a sub issue because Dan was trying to rescue Carol. He was trying to help her from that with that dog bite injury when he poured the heavy duty solvent on her wound, making it worse. It also said, the call of the question also said, if you remember, what arguments may Dan reasonably make? So we wanna think about defenses as well. So things like assumption of the risk, comparative negligence, and contributory negligence are going to be defenses that Dan will raise. So here's a list of our issues for Carol. Here's a list of the issues for Dan. So just running through, I've already made my list of all the different issues that I need to talk about. Next, we're going to want to do the R of IRAC, which is to state the rules. Um, and I want to talk briefly about how to learn those rules. So I said it's important that you make your own outlines. Um, the, the professor is grading this exam, and the professor is going to want to see you recite the rules the way the professor taught them. So it's important that you make your own outline based on your notes from class, and that you don't just get a commercial outline or someone else's outline, um, because that other outline might not have the rules stated as your professor is expecting them to be presented on your exam answer. So you should definitely be making your own. Making your own is also gonna help make sure that you understand the rules. Because if you don't understand them and it's just words on a page, it's gonna be really hard for you to go through those fact patterns and spot those issues. If you didn't know the rule for premises liability, it's gonna be hard for look, to look at that fact pattern, see that point that Bob and Carol are at Dan's house and have that trigger the fact that that creates a special type of duty that Dan owes to Bob and Carol. So it's important that you understand the rules as well. You also wanna make sure that you're actively reviewing your outlines, drawing pictures of the rules in your outlines, inventing mnemonics to help you remember the elements, um, trying to memorize them by repeating information out loud or explaining it to someone else. If you find it helpful to explain things and the, that helps it stick in your mind. Because as I said at the beginning, if you walk into the exam thinking to yourself, this is an open book exam, I'm just going to look everything up in my outline. You're not spending enough time writing your answer. There's a lot of information you can include in your answer. You saw that that essay probably has 10 to 12 different issues we can discuss. You could spend a lot of time writing an answer. So if you're looking everything up, you're going to miss out on your opportunity to fully answer each of those issues. As you're memorizing, go through your outline one section at a time before you move on. Um, you don't want to sit down with a huge outline. Like imagine sitting down with your entire real property outline and saying, okay, I'm going to read this outline today and I'm going to memorize it. That is super overwhelming. Um, and that to me is just, that sounds like a miserable day. So instead, take your outline in small chunks. Say, okay, I'm going to memorize what we learned in the first chapter of real property. Then once you feel comfortable with that, move on to the next chapter. You also want to make sure that you're coming back to the material uh, on a regular basis. So review your outline this week, then come back and review it again next week, and then the week after that. This is a great time if you haven't already to start studying. Hopefully you've already started your outlines. If not, you should start them immediately. If you have started your outlines, you can start reviewing them. You should be actively reviewing your outlines on a regular basis at this point in the semester. Uh, memorizing and reviewing your outlines is going to be a lot of work, so make sure you're taking breaks as you're doing this. Um, you don't want to try to sit down for hours and hours at a time because the information just is not going to stick with you. Uh, you're going to get burned out, and then come time for the exam, you're probably going to be exhausted, and you're not going to be able to adequately show off all this information that you spent the whole semester learning. So make sure you're reasonable on yourself and you give yourself some breaks as you're working on this. As I said before, make sure you understand the material um, as you're reviewing it. If you don't understand it and you're just trying to commit this to memory when it doesn't make any sense to you, it's going to be really hard to explain it in your exam answers. 
So consider getting a study partner or a tutor or even just Googling the topic and see if you can find a YouTube video explaining it or maybe an article explaining it in a different way from what your professor presented. Um, that way it makes sense to you and it's again more likely to stick with you. As you're reviewing, make sure you're focusing on what matters. So as you can see in that exam question that we looked at, the question does not um, necessitate the names of cases that you learned, um, who wrote a case, like what judge wrote an opinion. It does not, you usually do not need to know details from cases. It's going to depend on the, like the takeaways from the cases. So as you're making your outline, fine tuning your outline, reviewing your outline, make sure you're focusing on those things that you're actually going to use when it comes time to write your answer for the exam. Um, and it, as I said before, make sure you're learning the material the way your professor presented it, because they're the one that's grading this exam. And so they want to see that you've recited the information that you're presenting back the material the way that they taught it. That's going to be really helpful. Make sure you keep coming back to your outlines. I mentioned this a minute ago, um, because repetition is going to be the best way to make sure that this information is clearly at the front of your mind when it comes time for the exam. All right, so for this fact pattern, um, what I've done is gone through, and I'm not going to read this all to you. You can see this in the handout. And if you need a copy of the handout that goes along with these PowerPoint slides, uh, you can find a link to download the handout in the chat box. But I filled in the rule statement that goes along with each one of those issues that we already identified. So here's the rule for negligence. And then I mentioned that there were two sub issues for the negligence issue with the dog bite. The um, premises liability issue, and also the fact that this is a domestic animal, so we can start to fill in some of those rules. Negligence also has the requirements of breach, cause, uh, actual cause, proximate cause, and damages. It may be helpful to set those up as sub-issues rather than having one overarching uh, issue for negligence. You may have the overarching issue for negligence with many IRACs for each of the sub-issues underneath that issue. And that's exactly what your professor is looking for when they say don't have um, or don't get too hung up on the very straightforward IRAC method. The very straightforward IRAC could look like this at the top, I-R-A-C. What you may want to do for something like a negligence issue is more like this middle version where your issue is negligence. You state the elements of negligence, so duty, breach, causation, and harm. And then within the analysis section, you have many IRACs for each of those different um, pieces, different elements of negligence. So a mini IRAC for duty, a mini IRAC for breach, a mini IRAC for causation, and so on and so on. You might have issues that this doesn't work for either. And your IRAC ends up looking more like this bottom one, where within that analysis section, you have a mini IRAC. And then you can see in the second mini IRAC, the A of the, the mini IRAC has its own mini IRAC within it. Notice how we're not getting too hung up on that linear IRAC, but we're still incorporating all those different pieces of the IRAC. You're still identifying the issues, you're still stating the rule, you're applying the rule to the facts, and you're coming to a conclusion. This is what you should be doing. Even if your professor is not one of those that says, don't get too hung up on the IRAC format, this is going to give you a much, much better answer than just using a straightforward IRAC where you just have issue, rule, analysis, conclusion, issue, rule, analysis, conclusion. You're going to be able to talk about the nuances and how everything fits together better if you use one of these types of IRAC formats instead. As you're practicing, as you're studying, it's a great idea to get your hands on as many practice exams as you can. You do not want the final exam to be the first time that you sit down and practice applying the law that you, you have in your outlines to a hypothetical set of facts. You want to work the kinks out before it's time for the exam. So try to do as many practice exams as you can. And the best practice exams you can use are those that come with a model answer. That way you can not only practice your application skills, but then see how you did. And when you're using model answers, you should look for things like, did you spot the same issues? Did you miss any issues? Did you include issues that the model answer did not include? Did you over-include issues? Um, did you state the rules correctly? Did you discuss rules that were not relevant? 
in your analysis? Did you raise arguments for each party? Did you analyze um, the facts as in depth as the model answer does? Did you spend too much time analyzing something that's not relevant? These are all things that you can compare your answer to the model answer and see how you're doing and make improvements. Um, if you see that you're missing issues consistently, that's an indicator that maybe you just don't know the material well enough because um, the information is not in your head for the facts to trigger. Oh, that sounds like a premises liability issue. That sounds like a wild animal issue. And maybe you just need to, to review the big picture things a little bit more. So this is gonna help you figure out where you can make those improvements as you're doing these practice exams. A few last minute tips for essay exams. Number one, make sure you thoroughly analyze the issues but not the obvious ones. If they tell you, for instance, in a contract fact pattern, a valid contract was formed between Ann and Bob, and then they go on to discuss all of these other facts about how Ann and Bob acted after they formed this contract, you don't need to spend paragraphs and paragraphs analyzing contract formation. They told you that a valid contract was formed, so we don't need to analyze the different elements of contract formation. That's not going to get you any points. In fact, it looks like you didn't read the fact pattern carefully. So make sure you're just analyzing the issues that are most relevant to the fact pattern and that are actually issues. Next, state the relevant rules of law, but you don't have to state every rule of law that you know. Um, this is a common mistake that people make on ex essay exams is they outline dump. Um, what this shows or what the student is attempting to show is how much information they know. You're kind of saying to the professor, look at everything I know about this topic. Let me tell you all about it. What the professor sees when they read that answer is that you weren't exactly sure which law was applicable to these facts. So you just dumped everything and you hoped that something in there would stick and that something in there would be correct. So that's gonna show the professor that you you know the material and you could get a fine grade. You might get a B um, by outline dumping. The students who get the A, don't outline dump because they are able to fine tune their answer and just include the law, the rules and the law that is necessary to answer the question. So you don't want to over include too much information when you're identifying the rules. Third, use the facts that you're given to support your arguments, but don't just restate or summarize the facts. This is very, very hard to do if you're in the habit of doing this in your analysis. I know I had this issue when I first started writing law school exams, is you want to start your analysis by saying what happened. So in that exam uh, question that we looked at, for instance, if we're talking about, let's say, premises liability, we might start our analysis by saying, Bob and Carol went to Dan's house. The professor already knows that Bob and Carol went to Dan's house. The professor wrote the fact pattern, so he told you that they went to Dan's house. So you don't need to restate and retell the professor what happened in the fact pattern. If you find yourself doing this, instead of starting your analysis with facts, try to start your analysis with the law. So the law here would be premises liability. Um, so instead of saying Bob and Carol went to Dan's house, you could say because Bob and Carol were at Dan's house, Dan is a premises possessor, which means that he owed them a particular duty. So you're using the facts to illustrate how and why the law is applicable, not just restating what happened because that's not gonna get you any points. Fourth, use the facts to support your arguments, but don't make up any new facts and then discuss the facts that you made up. What happens when the professor sees this in your answer is that the professor is thinking, you didn't know what to do with the facts that I gave you. So you change the facts to make the fact pattern what you wanted to talk about. And now you're giving me a different answer to a totally different question from the one that I asked. Sometimes there are facts that are missing that you may need to hypothesize or you may need to point out. Like in this question, for instance, um, they told us that the dog didn't give any warning before it bit Carol on the hand, but we don't really know what that means. Did it just mean that in this instance, it came out of nowhere? Or does that mean that this has never happened before? So the fact that the dog has bit other people might be relevant to this fact pattern. But I won't just assume that that's the case, that the dog has or has not bit other people. 
I would use that fact and say something like, if the dog has bit other people, that makes it more likely that Dan should have known that the dog had a propensity to bite someone like Carol. But if the dog had not bit other people, then it was reasonable for Dan to think that the dog was safe and that something like this would not likely happen. So there's a fine line between making up facts and then hypothesizing additional facts that you might need in order to fully answer the question. Don't change the facts and then argue based on your changed facts, but you should identify facts that would be helpful to fully analyze your answer. If your professor includes multiple choice questions, it is so helpful to get as much multiple choice practice in as you can. JD Advising has a new program called the Law School Study Aids Program. This includes practice multiple choice questions um, that you can use to study for exams if you are in the position of having multiple choice questions on your exams. As you're doing multiple choice questions, it's important that you begin practicing them slowly and methodically. So you don't wanna just rush through them and see how many you get right and tally up your score. As you're practicing, do them slowly, do them one at a time, check the answer, make sure you understand the answer before you move on to the next one. As you get closer to the exam, you can start to work up um, sets of questions and work on your speed to make sure that you can answer the questions in the appropriate amount of time. But as you're starting, you should be doing multiple choice questions in a way that allows you to learn from the mistakes and from the questions that you're answering. If you have short answer questions on your exam, same thing, get your hands on as many short answer practice questions as you can. Find out if your professor releases old exams, if your school has a, um, an exam bank that you can use. Some supplements are really helpful for short answer practice, like examples and explanations, for instance, is a great supplement if you're looking for some short answer questions. Um, that could be really helpful. And if your exam will have a combination, so if it's some multiple choice, some short answer, some long essay, you should be allocating time in accordance with how much weight is accorded to each portion. So if the professor tells you that the essay is worth half the grade, you should, should spend half the time on the essay. Even if you feel like multiple choice is your weakness and you're thinking, well, I'm gonna spend more time on multiple choice because I know I need a little bit of extra time there and I'll just blow through the essay because I'm a great writer. You're not going to give the essay the justice it needs, so be sure to allocate your time appropriately based on how much to, um, weight your professor is giving to each portion. At this time, I'm going to turn things over briefly to Hannah, my colleague, and um, I also want to point out that if anyone has any questions, please feel free to submit them through the Q&A, and I'm happy to answer your questions as well, but Hannah's going to tell you just a little bit about JD Advising. Hi, everybody. My name is Hannah McNeese, and I am the account executive here at JD Advising. Um, I am also a licensed attorney in the state of Michigan and truly a testament to how fabulous JD Advising's materials really are, as I did use them myself. I just quickly want to touch on some of our products and services here that we think might be super beneficial as you navigate law school. I know Heather already touched on the law school study aids. This is honestly something I really wish I had when I was navigating my law school career. Um, she mentioned it comes with multiple choice questions. It also comes with essays and short answers. So I know Heather kind of touched on one of the most important things is really practicing essay questions to prepare for those final exams. This would be just yet another resource for you in order to do that. Um, we also have tons of free services as well. We have guides, um, blogs, webinars like this one, um, a newsletter that goes out regularly, and a free MPRE course when you get to that point um, in law school as well. I mentioned we have outlines in our law school study aids. This is a picture of all of the outlines that we have. So you'll see we do have all of the 1L topics, but we also have some 2L, 3L topics as well, secured transactions, business associations, and things like that. Lastly, for those who are kind of into the 2L, 3L portion, we do have courses for the bar exam. We'd be more than happy to chat with you about that if you're at that point. And lastly, um, and bestly, um, we do have benefits to ABA members, and you can see those here on the screen, um, some discounts on supplemental products and course services. Um, you can contact us by phone or email. I think that's on the last slide here. Um, please reach out if 
you have any questions that we can help you with, we would love to help you navigate um, your law school career and help you be successful there, um, the MPRE and the bar exam as well. Um, as Heather mentioned, if you have any questions, please drop them in the Q&A for us. We will stick around for a little bit. And thank you so much to the ABA for hosting this. Thanks, Hannah. And yes, thank you to everyone for coming today and to the ABA for hosting this for us. I hope you guys found this helpful. Please reach out to us if there's anything we can do to help as you um, begin to prepare for your final exams. If we don't hear from you, best of luck on those finals. Hi there, we do have one question about the slides and we will be sending out the slides, the replay link for the webinar and a link to the handout afterwards. And so we wanna thank everyone for joining us today and a special thank you to Heather Buck and JD Advising. We wish you success on your exams and hope you join us for future programming. Thank you.